Hi everyone and happy Thursday. I appreciate everyone taking time out of their day to join User IQ for our final webinar of the year, Five Customer Success and Product Management Trends for 2018. My name is Nicole Voino and I'll be your moderator for the webinar. I'm really excited to have these experts in the customer success and product management space here today to talk to you guys about this topic. Before we jump into our exciting content, I just want to take care of a few announcements. We will be recording this webinar and we'll send out the recording to everyone after the webinar. Please send any questions you have to the organizer and we'll make sure to leave some time to cover those at the end. And if you're having any audio problems or te technical difficulties, feel free to post those in the questions area and we'll make sure and try and help you out with those. Now, let's take some time to introduce the panelists we have and have them also share a little bit about themselves and their companies with everyone. Our first panelist is Jana Basto, and she's the co-founder of ProdPad, which is a product management software that helps you manage your roadmap and your product management backlog. ProdPad is a bootstrap team of product people that help make product management software for other product people. Jana also has found time to found Mind the Product, which is an international product management community that many of you are probably familiar with. They started that in 2010 and now it has more than 50,000 members in 100 cities around the world. Jana, are you there? Yeah, I am. Hi. Hey, Jana. Thanks for joining us today. Do you want to tell us any more about ProdPad? Uh, sure, thanks very much. Um, so thanks so much for having me here today. Uh, I think you gave everyone a really good outline of what ProdPad is, a tool for people who are building uh, their products and helps them figure out what to build based on insights from their customers and ideas from their team, uh, put it all together, create the roadmap that helps guide your team and uh, your, uh, uh, your product direction. Awesome. Well, we look forward to talking to you more and hearing your insights. Great. Thank you. Our next panelist is Irit Izips, and she's the CEO of CSM Practice, a high-growth customer success consulting firm that helps companies initiate, validate, and optimize their customer success programs. Irit is a very active thought leader in the customer success community and frequently publishes blogs and contributes to books about the topic. She's also been voted a top customer success influencer in social media for the past few years and she's also frequently invited to speak at conferences and customer success events. Eri, are you there? Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm super excited for today. Yeah, we're really excited to have you here. Do you want to give everyone a, you know, a better overview of CSM practice and you know, kind of the problems that your firm's passionate about helping companies solve for? I think what's exciting about being in this, pod, in this webinar is the range of experiences that we as a company have by working with so many different companies that do customer success from um, really small startups that are on their A round to extremely large enterprise organizations that are highly complex, uh, that are public and are multi-billion dollar companies. I hear as a, somebody that's involved in the community, you see me out in uh, different um, LinkedIn groups, trying to answer questions and also listen to what the community is saying and then the interactive uh, conversations that I so uh, frequently have in different events for customer success. And so I'd like to, you know, not everybody has that opportunity to be so involved and uh, I'd like to see these webinars as an opportunity to share what I see from my own world and my own observations with, with the community today. So thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for being with us and joining us. We're excited to talk to you. And our last panelist is Martin Erickson, and he's the co-founder of Mind the Product, which you, you know, was mentioned in Jana's profile as well. And Martin's been involved in product management for more than 20 years across startups and corporations and has led teams in Europe and the U.S. So in addition to serving as a co-founder and chairman as of Mind the Product, which is the world's largest product management community. He's also found time to interview product leaders from all over the world and co-author the book, Product Leadership, How Top Product Managers Launch Great Products and Build Successful Teams, which was just published this year. So congratulations. Martin, are you there? Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. 
Yeah, great to have you. Um, do you want to tell everyone a little bit more about Mind the Product? I think it's, uh, it started as a passion project with just 25 people in the back room of a pub to try and figure out what this job was and how we could get better at it. And it's obviously hit a nerve because we've grown a little bit since then. We have the meetup in 138 cities around the world and two conferences in London and San Francisco every year all around bringing that community together to help further the craft of product management. That's great, yeah. It's a great, great event if you haven't checked them out. All right, well, you'll get to hear more from all the panelists in just a little bit. And as I mentioned, I'm Nicole Voino, the CMO of UserIQ. I'll be serving as the moderator. UserIQ is based in Atlanta, Georgia, and we help create an exceptional product experience by delivering what each user needs to be successful in the moment. And as a result of that, we help you accelerate onboarding, improve feature adoption, reduce churn, and ultimately drive more revenue throughout the customer journey. I know many of you have attended some of our other webinars recently, and you know that we talk a lot about the alignment between customer success and product management in the customer journey. A recent survey we conducted examined some of those alignment gaps between these two groups and how they're working to bridge the divide to provide a more unified customer experience. In this webinar, we want to address some of the trends we expect to see in 2018 in these areas from both products and customer success and how these two groups will really work together to drive growth throughout the organization. So before we jump into our top five trends, I want to take a minute to talk about some of the areas that might have been really popular in 2017 that we're going to see fade away as we move into 2018. So Jana, let's start with you. What's one trend that you're expecting to see die off a little bit in 2018? Uh, it's something that's definitely going to change. I'm not sure if die off, but uh, there's a lot of uh, bad practices going around with how companies use and process your data. We all get tons and tons of spam. Most of it is not stuff that we're opting into. Uh, and so uh, there's a new initiative coming out, a new um, regulation coming out called GDPR. Uh, and I think that's going to uh, really start uh, forcing companies to change the way that they uh, collect data, how they get opt-in uh, permissions, uh, and how they design interfaces around people's uh, personal uh, data. And if people aren't familiar with GDPR, I know it's an EU initiative, can you give a little more background on that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as you said, it's an EU initiative, so it's something that's happening in Europe. Uh, but I think it is going to affect uh, companies around the world. Uh, it stands for General Data Protection Regulation, uh, and it's basically around uh, how um, how, uh, the, how companies process the data, the private data of, uh, of citizens, of their customers. Uh, and uh, uh, it basically... Uh, forces companies to be more compliant about how they gather information like email addresses, how they get opt-in consent, uh, being able to prove that, being able to show uh, that they're compliant. Mm -hmm. And it's not just EU companies that it affects, it mm -hmm. affects any company that touches EU mm -hmm. users. So even if you are American, you've got to deal with GDPR. Yep, definitely, that's a great one. And Eric, what about you? What's something that you're seeing change or fade away on the customer success side? In the customer success uh, community, we've seen a huge uh, hype around uh, a playbook automation. And when that community jumped on that uh, sort of like the trend, the initial things that we've seen is, you know, interpreting the pure segmentation pyramid and into three things like the high touch for strategic customers, mid touch for a, you know, the, the medium sized company or customer base. And then for the smaller customer base, uh, we used to say, you know, just do automated touch, which really a pure digital experience. I think that's going to go away a little bit. And in that, I mean, uh, believing that a pure digital touch or a pure digital experience for a company that is not e-commerce, it's not B2C, or, you know, they, they do have a choice in having a person uh, interfere with the experience of the user, uh, is going to be uh, switched into a more of a hybrid approach. And in fact, instead of seeing a pool CSM model, we're going to see more and more 
uh, the e emergence of a new role that's called a portfolio success manager that takes a, a bulk of the segment for the SMBs and will see sub-segmentation of that uh, lower uh, long-tail customer base by industries or languages or regions or all of the above so that we can better nurture each one of the sub-segmentations of that SMB base uh, with messages that resonates with them. So if initially we've seen uh, companies nurture these uh, the, or do nothing with the SMB and then maybe give them some community, uh, online communities or uh, some sort of like an email or a newsletter, we'll see a much more mature approach going forward. And I'll talk about it more during the webinar as we go through the specific trends. But um, I am going to see, what I'm expecting to see is going away from thinking that a pure digital experience for SMB in, in some uh, instances is just companies will realize that it's just not good enough. Uh, doing something is better than nothing, but it's not going to really optimize the way we approach um, those, th that segmentation. Okay, interesting. I can't wait to hear more about it. And Martin, what about you? What's your take on this? Uh, I think there's a couple of kind of big changes that are coming in in product management specifically, and a lot of around how we actually organize product management and development within uh, organizations. I think a, one large thing that is changing rapidly is that product management and development are becoming less and less of a silo in the organization, which I think we'll talk a bit more about on the webinar as well. But also I think a big one is for us as a role, we've kind of been obsessed with delivery over the last 20 years and figuring out how to, what processes we need and to deliver as much as possible, as quickly as possible, as cheaply as possible. And I think more and more we're moving away from that emphasis on delivery and the processes associated with delivery, like Agile, Scrum, and Kanban, and moving more and more to emphasize the discovery and making sure that we're actually building the right things for our customers and for our teams. Awesome. Well, good. I, again, I'm looking forward to talking more about some of those trends and initiatives that we're going to see coming up, too. So, well, now let's look ahead to 2018, which is somehow only a few weeks away. I can't believe it. But the first trend we'll talk about is the rise of a product-led growth strategy and a real emphasis on putting the user front and center. OpenView Labs just if you haven't checked it out, recently released a great product-led growth playbook with tips for implementing this strategy for more cost-effective growth and cites some great companies that do this like Slack, HubSpot, and Dropbox that have done it and done it really well. But given that, this is obviously not something brand new, but it's a shift that many companies are trying to make and trying to wrap their heads around the right way to do this. Jana, I know this strategy is the foundation of your company, ProdPad, so talk about why it's important to build a product that's made for the user and how you're really doing this successfully. Jana, did we lose you? Ah, hi. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, okay. So I wouldn't actually say that it's necessarily the foundation, but uh, because it wasn't necessarily something that we thought of when we first launched the product. We focused on building a product that was useful, but we didn't really think about our growth strategy or how the product would play into that. Uh, we started seeing a turning point when uh, we, um, a couple of years ago, when we started looking at the data and realized that, realized that we could um, actually grow our revenue, our bottom line, a lot uh, by getting more users to see the value of the product earlier on. So we started setting objectives around, you know, the time that it takes them to see the product itself. You know, a lot of other uh, companies out there will have a um, request demo form or, uh, you know, won't show real versions of the product directly on the website. And so we wanted to put it much more front and center. But also, once they get into the app, uh, we started really focusing around the time until they get that first wow moment, that moment that they see something that they go, this is really going to help me with X. Uh, so we really started focusing on bringing that moment up, uh, you know, within the first few minutes of using the product. Uh, and uh, we also set an objective around, uh, you know, how long it would take to actually get a, uh, a credit card or a commitment to uh, go forwards. 
uh, we actually did a few experiments where we played with the trial time and we uh, we actually gamified the uh, the initial trial time and the onboarding flow uh, to encourage people to use the app and find that wow moment uh, but in the uh, process we actually brought the uh, the average time to first payment down from uh, 36 days down to 11 days so it meant that we were people get getting people in and using the app but also paying for the app much more quickly than they used to Wow, I mean that's all really important in helping those users realize value really quickly and seeing that payoff and getting that time to value. Or I like the time to wow that you said. <laughs> um, Eric, although you know product-led growth may sound like it's shifting away from the customer, it's important to note that it's actually kind of the opposite. It's about building products that customers love and want to use so that expansion and retention can sometimes be a no-brainer. I mean how can this change the game for customer success? Irid, are you there? Can you hear me now? Yep. Awesome. I think anybody that's listening right now and uh, in customer success that's hearing that product is going to be more aligned with what works best in terms of user experience is, is getting really happy right now. I mean, one of the challenges for customer success managers is that they have to deal with a product that's not optimized for user experience or is not exactly aligned with what users are trying to accomplish from a business outcome standpoint and then instead of working with clients on additional business outcomes they deal with support escalation tickets and uh, dealing with teaching the client to just how to learn how to use the product so I think that the the PLG as you call it the product led growth strategy is an excellent movement to help customer success teams get to where they really want to be, which is working with clients on business outcomes and then aligning the technology on how they can support the client in that. And um, especially that would that would be uh, an, a massive help with startups or any company that where the product is felt like it's a little bit immature or needing some additional help in the, the UI front of things. Yeah, definitely. And Martin, what about you? What are some characteristics of successful companies that are able to drive growth through the product? I think uh, a lot of it comes down to how you organize your teams, which is a lot of what we uncovered in the book, and that the kind of leading edge, best in class organizations are all around kind of small, nimble, cross-functional teams that have autonomy to execute on their own plans. And the reason that's so important is that it puts the decision making as close to the customer as possible instead of having to filter it up and down the organization a few layers. And I think the other one is that the best teams balance quantitative and qualitative data. We often get mired in debates around data versus kind of customer research and really you have to have both in tandem because quantitative data can only tell you what happened and the customer research and insight can tell you why it happened. So I think more and more we're just seeing this combination of data and insight uh, in small teams that can take that insight and execute it on it as quickly as possible. Yeah. I think that's a great point and I want to dive into this next trend now and talk a little bit to Irate about what we're seeing and what we're gonna, how we're going to see customer success become a more mature and established department and function in 2018. Sorry, I'm trying to flip to the next slide. And um, <laughs> one aspect of this trend is, you know, it's now natural we're seeing, you know, how we have a marketing operations or a sales operations manager. Right. I think we're now going to see an increase, like you said, in a customer success operations role in 2018 to her departments are becoming more efficient and focused on driving results. So talk to us a little bit about what's driving the demand for these roles. I mean, look, if, if you think of PLG as the, you can think of PLG as the customer success operations firm, a customer success on the user level front. And then for each customer success manager, if they own anywhere between five to 50 to 100 accounts, they need to have the same level of insights of each account at any given point. When you are a customer success manager, there's a lot of things that you need to do during the day. And so uh, having a customer success operations manager is great to do, uh, you know, one-to-many programs, 
really perform analytics around the customer, uh, customer segment and the customer base to, to showcase better insights that we can lead to uh, better playbooks, create training materials and templates for the CSM teams and, and, and manage the customer success systems that the team is using. I think the trend that we're going to see in 2018 is not only uh, a, an increased investment in customer success operations, but we're also going to see a divergence of that role. Because let me tell you, nobody can really wear all four hats of running program one to many programs, really be good at analytics, and uh, great at enablement, as well as be technical enough to manage all of the technology systems that a team might have. So what we're going to see is an implementation of that trend, uh, more customer success operations uh, support and, and resources for organizations, but then also an increase in the type of specific roles that we see within that team. That's interesting. Yeah, I definitely have seen that playing out a little bit and, you know, seeing more job postings for that as well. And I think as we're seeing that the rise of that role, you know, you talked about this a little bit earlier as we're saying, you know, we're talking about what's going away in customer success. But, you know, how are teams going to get more sophisticated in their engagement approaches and kind of what trends are you seeing take shape in that area with their programs and what are they doing there with these engagement models? Yeah, I mean, once you have a dedicated resource for customer success operations, you know, instead of like if last year, most of my customers and, you know, community members talked about, all right, we're going to do automated playbooks and our communication to clients is going to be as such as that we're going to send an email when uh, a customer reaches a milestone. I think that's great as a first step. Now, both the customer success operating tools as well as the resources that the team has available is, is much richer. So what I'm seeing now is a trend from, okay, let's just send them an email uh, at the milestone point. Now we have enough resources to think through what is a sequence email that we're going to send out to the customer at the milestone point. Uh, point or at a risk point. So instead of just having it as a milestone, we're going to launch uh, customer campaigns or email campaigns based on usage trends, which works really well with um, information that we're starting to gather and capture from solutions like user IQ. But we're also going to have potentially like dedicated portfolio success managers for the small business segment and now come up with complete email campaigns and sequence emails based on specific languages and industries and use cases. So I think that's going to be super exciting to see companies become better and more sophisticated with their automated communications to clients. Yeah, I mean, I think it's very, you know, you're seeing that just like you would nurture a buyer and with marketing automation and the buyer's journey, you have to keep that same nurturing and be very sophisticated in how you nurture your customer and the customer journey as well. So I'm excited to see that play out more. And how do you think the market, you know, I don't think we have, but, you know, do you think the market has reached its peak for customer success tools or are we just at the beginning and what are we going to see from tools in 2018? You know, it's a really interesting <laughs> question, and I smile because I just got back from Dreamforce, which is absolutely an amazing conference, and I was just buffled by how, like, I was walking in the expo area, which was, I don't know, had hundreds of solutions, and literally every third booth had something, some slogan related to customer success. Wow. So I, I, I think it, this, we're just at the tip of the iceberg. Uh, while you know we have the, the main platforms for customer success operations, there's so many different things that we do post sales with clients. And I, I think the technology industry understands that and tries to get you know more and more technologies to help optimize now specific processes. And I think it's all going to be, uh, tied in a bow at some point, but we're seeing an influx of technologies emerging to cater to different specific needs at with, you know, for the customer success team specifically, but for the post sales um, process in general. 
Yeah, and that's really interesting too because I think everyone thinks of Dreamforce sometimes as such a marketing and sales oriented conference. But, you know, I, I didn't go to Dreamforce, but some people on my team did. And I definitely heard that trend too of customer success being so prevalent there. Martin and Jana, anything you would want to add here? Not specifically, I think as a, you know, we'll talk a little bit about cross-functional in, in the next stage, but I think it is more and more just seeing, you know, the ownership of customer success is a great thing to see and, and seeing it as, as a role and a function that's critical to make sure that not just the customer is having the best possible experience, but we're looping that information back into the product development process and, and building a better product at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah, definitely seeing that uh, customer success is, uh, a, you know, a function that crosses over so much with um, with uh, sales, with retention, with marketing. Um, uh, you know, it's it's almost as if uh, you can't do one without really doing the other. Uh, customer success is really just, uh, if you're talking in the context of a SaaS company, it's uh, convincing somebody to continue purchasing your product every month. Somebody's implicitly making a purchase decision to renew uh, and so customer success is absolutely key in that uh, in that particular process. Yep. It was basically well, your first hire, wasn't it, Jenna? Uh, it was our absolute first hire, was a uh, head of customer success, yep. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah, well, thanks, Yurit. You really shared some great insights and I'm excited to watch how these trends play out in 2018. And yeah, let's move into our next trend, which is that products can no longer be siloed. Um, there's really a need for this cross-functional alignment in order to drive that voice of customer in product. And I think Martin's the perfect person to talk about this. And I want to hear from him why product has been siloed, you know, quite frequently and why he's seeing this shift to better integrate with the rest of the organization. Well, I think the, the reason products historically been siloed is that it's it's often been part of a, another department. Um, it's not been as core as it is to the business operations as it is today. So it was either in marketing or it was in technology. Um, as I alluded to, and kind of the trends going away, it was very much focused on delivering features or delivering uh, stuff out the door. It was much more of a, uh, you know, how do we take uh, something in engineering and ship it to the customer instead of a, building a great experience. And I think as, you know, a lot of trends have come together, for example, the consumerization of enterprise software, um, the general kind of design and, and UX trends that we see that require product to take a much stronger role in the organization. And I think in many organizations, the product is the business at the end of the day. So kind of bringing that out of the, that silo uh, has been a critical way to ensure that the right amount of focus and resources is spent on developing the best possible product. And I think the reason why it's now being better integrated into the rest of the organization is that no one team, no one role can actually know everything that there is to know about the customer or uh, the technical solutions that are possible to help solve the customer problem. And so, what we're seeing as that trend of cross-functional alignment is really about bringing together everybody who has that information um, so that they can understand not just the kind of customer problem in the best possible way, but also understand what are the solutions that are possible? What's the solution space that engineering and, and data science can bring to the table to help solve that problem? And the more we can make that a cross-functional team, uh, the more likely we are to actually build a great product and, and keep developing that. And have you seen examples of where companies are doing this really well and they've ha instituted a great cross-functional approach together? Yeah, I mean, I've seen a, there's a few examples actually I can talk about. One is um, my co-author, Nate Walkingshaw, who's the CXO at Pluralsight, um, is really interesting because he came from the product side of the, the company, um, but now is the, is the chief experience officer, which means he actually owns all of product and all of customer success and all of editorial and all of marketing, because it's realizing that it's kind of one customer experience, no matter what the touch point is, and that there has to be kind of a central ownership and a central um, cross-functional way to deliver that experience. And you have to be able to make the trade-offs between what you're building in the product, but also how you're servicing that, how you're selling it, how you're provisioning it, et cetera, at the back end. And I think another great example is a, a startup here in London called TransferWise, which does online currency transfers. They're probably my favorite story about building 
small cross-functional product development teams. Uh, one of the examples from them is a team called the Currencies Team, which are responsible for any new currency path they launch. So, for example, when they launched uh, transferring pounds to dollars, this was a team that decided to do that and set that up. And of course, it's not just a question of adding a, a drop down to a, a field. Uh, you have to actually open local bank accounts. They have to make sure they comply with local regulations. So that team doesn't just have a product manager, a designer, and a couple of engineers. They actually also have a lawyer and a banker full time in that team, completely embedded, so that they have all the resources they need to be able to execute on their own goals. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> You know, I know Eri mentioned that we're going to see an increase in companies who invest in customer success systems. Do you think we're going to see that on the product management side, you know, there are tools that they're investing more in that help talk to the customer success systems to help them prove value and, you know, understand that voice of customer more? Do you think we'll see a rise of that in 2018? Definitely. I think there's a, a bit of a gap there. I think there are, there are more and more great tools kind of growing up for each of the the kind of functions of so customer success tools, there's great product tools like ProdPad, and some of them do kind of blur the, the lines between those teams, but I think there's definitely need to have something that can be that store of information and be that kind of data, data bank of insight. Mm -hmm. uh, a great example there is actually um, a company called Telenor, which is the Norwegian state telco company. They have operations in something like 23 countries around the world. Um, they have a, a central seed bank, which I think is basically just a wiki at this point, of all of the ideas that they've ever had in the organization, all the, the kind of product tests that they've gone out with, all the assumptions that they've gone out and tested, all the user research that they've done that anyone in the company can look up, which just means that they can springboard any new product idea by looking at all the research they already have, all the information they already have from existing customers, and figure out where to go from there. Wow. Okay. Yeah, to add to that, we're definitely seeing a, a trend in that where people are moving away from just looking at their uh, their, their uh, you know new feature ideas or product ideas in terms of uh, personas that they affect or user stories, but actually in terms of uh, closing the loop with customers, being able to tie back things that are on the roadmap to the customers who asked for them, the specific things that they asked for, and the context in which they, they had that problem or that suggestion, uh, which means that the solutions that are coming out of the, uh, the back end of that are more useful for the, the customers. They're actually solving the problems more often on the, the first shot, rather than sort of being uh, generalized ideas that fit personas, which are never quite real people. Yeah, and do you guys see product share, any KPIs usually with customer success in these organizations? Or even in your own organization, Jana? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, we're seeing a, a lot more, uh, not just our company, uh, mm -hmm. but other companies as well, driving towards the, um, the objectives, you know, for trying to figure out what the, uh, the outcome should be for any particular uh, initiative or uh, problem that's been, uh, that's been outlined. And yeah, I think that's definitely one reason why solid cross-functional teams are, are so valuable is because they are all aligned at the same goal. So yeah. they're all about whatever whatever that goal is, if they own a, a part of the, the product, or they own a customer segment, or they own a, an experience for the, the customer, that whole team is aligned around that goal and improving that experience for the customer. And so that means automatically that everyone in that team is aligned around the same goals. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, Engineers in that team will have alignment with other engineers and other teams to make sure that they have are building to the right technical architecture and things like that. Customer service in those teams will obviously have alignment with other customer service teams to make sure that they're looking at the big picture. But really this cross-functional trend means that all of the individuals in that team are actually pulling in the same direction and, and aiming for the same goal and sitting next to the people who can help achieve that. Yeah, on a similar thread, uh, you know, we all know the uh, the Steve Blank, the advice from Steve Blank, which is to get out of the building to go spend more time with your customers, which of course is important. But you know, as a product person, you've got a million things to do. Uh, doesn't it make more sense to bring somebody who represents the customers in? So we're actually seeing people from customer success and customer service teams. Um, actually become part of the product team, uh, you know, to represent uh, everything that they're hearing from the customers to bring them in, in that much closer. Yeah, we've seen that as well, so I think that works really well. All right, well, the, Martin, anything else you want to add to this trend? No, I think it's just 
again, re-emphasizing that it's all about putting the decision making as close to the customer as possible. I think what we've seen in the past has been, you know, the filtering of all that information. Every time you filter it and every every layer up in the organization you have to go to get to a decision, the less likely it is to be aligned with the customer needs and the customer want. So that's why these cross-functional teams that actually have the autonomy to execute on their goals is so critical. I agree. I think that's a really important point to make and, you know, excited to see this again play out more as teams move towards that cross-functional alignment in 2018. Let's move into our fourth trend and as a reminder, if you have any questions for the panelists, we want to make time to answer those at the end, so feel free to chat those into the questions area. The fourth trend is that we're going to see this rise of the chief product officer role in 2018 and really having that seat for them at the leadership table. Jana, we're seeing this chief product officer role be considered a critical first hired, you know, almost any tech company now. And I know we're just starting to see this take off. So what's behind this rise and what's going to happen in 2018? Yeah, and this actually uh, very much ties into the trend that uh, Martin had identified mm -hmm. uh, because it's actually with this rise of the chief product officer, the CPO, that uh, product teams are given more responsibility and power and autonomy. Um, you know, previously, if you look back five to ten years ago, it was very rare to actually find somebody to uh, who would have this seat. Product would report into uh, a chief tech, uh, technology officer, so the CTO, uh, sometimes the CMO, reporting into marketing, uh, sometimes directly into the CEO, but very rarely would they have a seat on the table. And it's starting to change the way that people uh, that businesses perceive product. Uh, product has always been a really tough one to measure, unlike marketing, who you can measure in terms of ROI on campaigns, or development, who you can measure based on velocity points, or burn down charts, or story points, um, or sales, which obviously is easy to measure, you just measure the number of uh, dollars that they make. With product, it's actually really, really difficult to measure and put a, a number on you know, whether product team is any good or not. Um, so I actually don't have the answer to this. This is actually something that I'm actively listening for and trying to figure out how, how this is going to shape product in the future. Um, but, uh, you know, looking at how organizations will actually measure and understand how effective their, uh, their product teams are. Yeah, and I think it also might be interesting to like talk about a little bit here if customer success is going to have that same seat at the C level in the chief customer officer role and if we think that's kind of changed over time and if that's going to be a trend in 2018 if we're going to see that rise. I don't know, you know, what you read if you want to weigh in on that too if that's going to change in 2018. You read, are you there? Uh, yeah, I don't, you know, that's not exactly, I don't know if there's going to be huge changes in that. Mm. It's my silence. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's going to, um, uh, it, it's sort of a, a, a trend that's indicative of a bigger change that's happening in companies. You know, it indicates that the, uh, the company actually respects product and that uh, product culture is important to the team. Uh, it tends to track with the trend of moving away from a delivery mindset and more to a discovery mindset, as Martin described earlier, uh, looking at outcomes over output or looking to build value for the company by looking at, uh, by bringing the customers in closer. Um, I think some of this is being done in response to the fact that um, uh, you know, you've got these big organizations who have historically moved really slowly and now they've got all these startups nipping at their heels with their fast product thinking and, you know, building and solving problems faster than these larger companies can. So you're starting to see some of these companies go through these digital transformations. Uh, and I think opening up product role at the, uh, at the executive table is uh, a key part of that. I mean, I think just from my perspective, you know, it has seen the chief product role and even the chief customer officer role, both at the executive table, showing that they're really focused on the customer and the post-sales experience. You know, before you might have just seen marketing and sales, like you said, at that table, but you're seeing these other roles and the importance that it plays on that and that focus on the customer and how everyone has to, is critically focused on that and their objectives and solving for their needs. 
personally, I think it's a great trend. I, it's mm -hmm. not an area of expertise for mine to say, you know, whether there's more chief product officers or not. I just don't have his ability to that. But I, I'm really thrilled to hear that, in general, product is more focused now, not just on the UI and the user experience, but also on can we create a product that helps prove the value achieved for clients? Can we create a product that helps um, clients understand or users understand what kind of value they can receive from the product? And so to that extent, I think that that, that trend is exciting. And if before, mainly we've seen the product team focused on user level success, what I'm hearing uh, is being said is that now we're going to see uh, a trend towards helping bring value to the overall account. And I'd be super curious to see how this trend shapes up in uh, 2018. I think the, the challenge is also to recognize that all organizations are slightly different, right? And that's where the emphasis changes depending on the core of the business. So. If you are a SaaS business and your entire business is built around delivering a product online, um, you have to have a CPO or someone at that level because it is the business, basically. I think something, uh, just off the top of my head, thought about Zappos is a good example where the product is kind of commoditized. Yes, they do have to execute on the product. They have to have you know, a great user experience online, but actually where Zappos kind of really dominated the market was in customer service and in kind of the customer success side after that. Um, and so having that person sit on the, on the, at that exec level is obviously critical for that business. So I think it's also recognizing where different organizations have different emphasis and different focus and, and different competitive advantages and making sure that those are having that senior level representation uh, at the strategy and execution level. Yep. I think those are all good points. Jana, anything else to wrap up this trend? Uh, nothing that I'd uh, want to add to that. Okay. Well, great point. And again, interesting to see as we move forward. You know, we'll have to check in on all these trends and do a midpoint like June check-in on where we are. For the last one, you know, I want to take some take time to take some audience questions. So. We'll talk about this question and but this trend, sorry. But it seems like sometimes you can't go a day without hearing about artificial intelligence or machine learning. And, and there are some really startling stats, like this one from Forrester, that investment in artificial intelligence will grow 300% in 2017. And Gartner says that by 2020, 85% of customer interactions will be managed without a human, which is kind of scary. Um, but, you know, you can say that AI machine learning is a good thing and it's going to become a necessity to incorporate this into the product for a more sophisticated customer approach. But there's also a lot of hesitations to it. So I kind of want to talk about both sides of those things. So, Martin, what role do you see product playing and, you know, people doing AI and machine learning right? I think the uh, the reason it's so important to have strong product management here is that it's at the moment it's kind of a technology looking for a problem to solve. There's so many things that you can do with it that you need to shape the strategy and the shape the direction from that customer centric kind of view that a product manager should be bringing to the table, and making sure that the computers are adapting to humans rather than the other way around. Uh, I think AI has a lot of promise and has a lot of things that it can help improve the product and help improve the customer experience. But we need to shape that and make sure that we're doing it for the right reasons and from to solve the right problems as opposed to just kind of throwing up a, a chat bot at the site and saying that we have AI. Yeah. That's a good point. And Irid, how do you adopt, like how can customer success maybe adopt machine learning techniques to make data-driven decisions on things like customer churn? Yeah, so we definitely see an increase in trend for companies to leverage predictive analytics uh, into an early warning system. And in fact, we see some of the customer success operations uh, solutions incorporate that into their product so that instead of having a predictive or statistical analysis on massive amount of data as a separate project, the insights are going to be done at the product level and the product is going to make recommendations for you know early warning um, you know triggers for clients 
And so I think that's really exciting. I mean, one of the challenges, like I said, that customer success managers have is the abundance of data related to customer. And no human can really process that for a single client, let alone if you have thousands of clients or hundreds of thousands of users or just hundreds of thousands of transactions. And so in that capacity, I do see machine learning being a critical part in the evolution of customer success. And the trends that we're going to see for 2018 is that a customer success tools are going to be shoring up recommendations for customer success teams automatically as they're going to analyze the data um, in, you know, that they, get, they capture. And then uh, we're going to see more organizations invest in an early warning system by incorporating machine learning models uh, to analyze massive amount of data they have about clients and get more sophisticated around how they do safe playbooks and mitigate risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think those are you know really great uses and important for that and would save time on the customer success side. Jana, I know you said, you know, on the opposite side of things, you guys haven't dabbled in this area yet and, you know, kind of haven't seen anything convincing. So what would, you know, convince you to look at this more and invest in it and yeah. in that way? I mean, the data side, the data analytics side is really, really interesting and I'm looking forward to seeing some actual useful um, uh, applications coming out of it. Right now, I think there's a lot of vaporware. A lot of companies claiming that they have it, but in reality, it's you know, a, a, it's a keyword anal uh, analysis and sentiment analysis, and less about actual uh, machine learning or any sort of intelligence. Um, you know, we, we're seeing a lot of uh, companies out there with chatbots, and of course, every site seems to have uh, you know the intercom operator or something similar to that, which you know is a good step, but it's still so nascent, and it's almost akin to having a you know automated phone system. Yes, it does cut down on the number of people who have to uh, deal directly with the customers, but it can be frustrating for the customer, and so I think we've got to cross that gap, that that chasm. Mm -hmm. Uh, to make it actually useful for our customers. Yep. Well, it definitely seems like we're going to see some interesting ways to look at data, and there's a lot of opportunity there, but, you know, still people have some hesitations as they looked ahead to that AI and machine learning in 2018 and how to incorporate that into the customer and product experience. Yeah, and I think product managers actually have a, sorry, just add to that, I think no, product managers ahead. have a really big role. And this isn't going to happen in 2018, but of mm -hmm. course we've all heard the uh, uh, the warnings or you know possibly fear-mongering or not about uh, AI. And I think product people have this massive job, which is to uh, set the, you know, to basically set the specifications for um, you know what uh, we could do with AI so that it doesn't turn into something evil <laughs> or out of control down the line. Um, I, I asked a question uh, at a product, uh, it was a product tank about uh, AI the other day and uh, we had three speakers from three different angles and I asked the question about how long until we actually have um, systems that can build themselves you know, being able to say to your phone uh, or to Alexa, you know, I, I have this idea for an app, can you help me build it? And a system that actually allows you to build it. And w immediately all, spe all three speakers jumped at the question. One said, uh, it's never going to happen. The other one said, oh, it'll definitely happen. The third one said, it's already happened, here's an example. Uh, so I think the, uh, the jury's out on, you know, where it's actually going to go. Yeah, it's scary to think about some of those things. <laughs> And again, to Jenna's point, that's why it's so important that we do think about them and we design these systems with that in mind, that at the end of the day, um, you know, we're shaping products that impact people's lives and user experiences yep. and we need to take that really seriously and, and, and use this human-centered design approach to making sure that we're building it for the right reasons. Right. Yeah, I think that's a very important decision. Well, I know we've covered a lot on the webinar, so I want to take some time to take a few questions that have come in. We had one come in from Matt and he asked, you know, how do we decide who our ideal customers are that we actually want to get feedback from since not all customers, you know, are a good fit and might not provide the best feedback. Does anyone want to take that question? 
I think Lincoln uh, Murphy has a really good blog about how to define the ideal uh, customer profile. <laughs> uh, I highly recommend reading that and following through. Uh, we, yeah, and then we do a, a simple exercise with clients. I don't know if you wanted to take that on where we would actually go through an exercise of what what are the be what are best breed of customers, and then um, try to define what are the main attributes that uh, across the board are similar or mutual for all of them, and then define it from there. Uh, but I definitely recommend that blog. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll definitely give a, a thumbs up to that one as well. I read Lincoln Murphy stuff. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that your um, your users will change over time. You know, when you're first launching a product, this is what we found when we launched uh, ProdPad. When we first launched it, uh, uh, it was really easy to get our initial few users on, our initial you know couple hundred uh, customers, because these were people who'd never seen anything like it and were inherently curious and interested in this sort of space. Uh, but then over time, you realize that these same customers matured. You know, they when they first came in, that cohort of customers were all brand new and were just learning this tool. Today, those customers who are still with us are super advanced users who are looking for more and more. Um, uh, robust functionality and reporting tools and other things like this. So people who were our ideal customers back then are still ideal customers in many ways, but they're very much different than the customers who joined in the last month or so. Yeah, that's a good thing. As you're growing and scaling, it's going to be changing. Yeah, it might be important to take a stab at it uh, from time to time as what is my ideal customer now? <laughs> like maybe once a year or so. Yeah, we had another question come in that was from Laura, and she asked, you know, how do you balance listening to your customers with trying to innovate your product in ways that customers may not be able to, you know, understand all the new features you're rolling out as you're, you know, constantly innovating and rolling out new, you know, features in your product. So I think it's that balancing of what your customers know about your product with what you're trying to innovate and develop. I think this is one of the kind of key misunderstandings of customer research generally and, and when people you know say that Apple doesn't do customer research for example it's that the whole point is not to go out and ask what the customer wants in the product what features they want uh, or even if you do that it's really about understanding the problem that they have behind it and right. by understanding the customer problem you can then bring that back in-house and that's where you can apply your innovation that's where you can apply what you know about the technology, what you know about the platform that you, you're working on in order to build something better to solve that problem better. And I think that's the ultimate goal of customer research and why we have to combine both data with that qualitative research of going out and speaking to customers but also observing them ideally in their own environment, in their own context of how they're using your product, where, where is it they're getting frustrated, where are they you know, flipping over to Excel to do something and then coming back to your product um, where are the things that they might not even be able to articulate are causing them problems or are customer problems that you could actually solve. And then bringing that information, like I said, back to the rest of the team so you can all bring to bear the experience and the information that they have internally about coming up with a better way to do that. And ultimately, that's how we do innovation. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, anything else to add there? Well, I think that covers a lot, and you know, I'll let us end, you know, wrap up a few minutes early so that everyone can get on with their days. But you know, I really appreciate the panelists taking the time on our webinar today. You know, Jana, Martin, and Erie, you guys were amazing. Your thoughts and trends for 2018 were on point, and I'm really excited to watch these play out. If you guys, if anyone has further questions or feedback, you can email me, Nicole, at useriq.com, and we'll be sending everyone a copy of the recording tomorrow. And just a shameless quick useriq plug, we're offering the chance to win a VIP package to Saster. That includes a ticket, a hotel room, and a flight if you take a test drive of useriq before December 29th. So you can go to info.useriq.com backslash Saster 18 ticket giveaway to find out more about that. But that's all for now. Again, we really appreciate everyone and their time today. And thank you so much. And have a great rest of your year. Thanks so much Bye. for having us. Yeah, thank you, thank guys. You.